Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, as we look today at the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Because by the end of the 1970s, a decade of social upheaval and economic stagflation had produced a sense of malaise in America. And furthermore, ever since the New Deal, and certainly since the Great Society and the turmoil of the counterculture, there had come to be a greater and greater divide between liberals and conservatives in America. Indeed, there had come to be um, a new right in America, a union of religious and economic conservatives, formed uh, in as moral traditionalists rejected the counterculture, and as middle class and wealthy Americans got tired of government taxing and spending. The silent majority was no longer silent. Um, Jerry Falwell, one of the televangelists of the 1970s and later, um, in 1979, formed a group called the Moral Majority to encourage conservative Christians to get out and vote, bringing religion very clearly into politics. In 1980, uh, Republican and Democratic conservatives of all types, religious, economic, small government conservatives, united behind a man who promised a small government, a strong military, and traditional morality. Ronald Reagan, um, a former actor and politician from California. And this has sometimes been called the Reagan Revolution, um, as Reagan brought together um, a new coalition, uh, building uh, on Goldwater's conservative movement and Nixon's Southern strategy and appeals to the silent majority. Reagan brought Southern Democrats, Southern white Democrats, um, and conservative Christians around the country, um, described sometimes as Reagan Democrats, pretty solidly into the Republican Party. Um, and with the support of these traditionally conservative Democrats, Reagan beat Carter in the election of 1980, um, becoming, when he was sworn in at the age of 69, the oldest man to become president to that point. Um, since then, Donald Trump would be sworn in at the age of 70, and Joe Biden at the age of 78. Reagan asked voters if they were better off today than they were four years ago, and clearly they felt they were not. In his inaugural address, Reagan said government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. And he supported the deregulation of business. Um, to make business more competitive and thus more profitable once they had less government oversight holding them back. And he hoped to fix the economy through what's officially known as supply-side economics. Cutting taxes, um, which would allow corporations and individuals um, to increase spending. Corporations in particular could afford to increase investment um, and hire more employees. Um, and that, in turn, would enrich the average person, um, who would also grow richer as her tax rates were cut. Some people, however, described this as trickle-down economics, suggesting that um, it was offering benefit to the rich with the hope it would trickle down to others. Um, some described it um, as simply as Reaganomics, um, the economics of Reagan. Um, and there were some, too, who called it voodoo economics, a term originally used by George Bush when he was running against Reagan um, in the Republican primaries. He quit using the term voodoo economics when he was named Reagan's vice presidential candidate. But he described Reaganomics as voodoo economics because Reagan had said that cutting taxes would actually raise money for the government because... Um, as the government cut taxes and people made more money, the government would end up getting, a, while a smaller slice, a share of a bigger pie. But Bush said it was black magic to say we could tax people less and yet make more money in taxes. Reagan did cut taxes as president. In his first three years, he lowered taxes by 25%, although he did eventually uh, approve some small tax increases to try to deal with increasing defense spending. And at first, Reaganomics did not seem to be working. 
It was a bad recession from 1980 to 1982. Um, unemployment reached 10% in 1982, um, the worst uh, since the Great Depression, at least at that point. But by 1983, the economy was beginning to turn around, and overall, the economy was growing, although the number of poor Americans increased, although partly due to immigration from poor countries, mainly Mexico, as people came to America hoping to improve their incomes. Furthermore, um, the income of middle class and working class Americans largely stagnated. Most of the economic growth in terms of personal income was seen by the wealthiest Americans. Furthermore, while Reagan had promised to cut government spending, it was not that simple. While he did cut spending on some programs, um, he also increased military spending in a new arms race with the Soviet Union. Furthermore, um, taxation, especially with his tax cuts, did not keep up with spending. Um, and the national budget deficit more than tripled. The national debt grew from $907 billion in 1980 to $2.6 trillion um, in 1988. Um, numbers which seemed to be horrifying at the time. Of course, by October of 2018, the national debt would be over $21.7 trillion, um, or over 100% of our gross domestic product, the highest percentage since the late 1940s. And while deregulation benefited the economy in some ways, in other ways it hurt quite a bit. For example, the savings and loan industry was deregulated. Savings and loans are a type of bank. Um, and with less government oversight, um, some savings and loan executives skimmed off millions of dollars, simply stealing directly from the banks. Others made bad loans without government oversight, and over a thousand savings and loan banks collapsed. Um, and in 1989, right after Reagan left office, the government would have to deal with this. Because in the past, if a bank went bankrupt, people's savings were lost. But now, thanks to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, they would get their money back, but that would cost the U.S. government $200 billion to repay depositors who'd lost money when the savings and loan banks failed. Reagan was also criticized by some for not spending enough money on environmental research, particularly as there were fears of acid rain rain acidified by pollution that killed wildlife um, and poisoned rivers and streams. He also um, put very, very little emphasis um, on age research. Age was first reported in the U.S. in 1981, and at first was poorly understood and very deeply stigmatized. Um, when the first AIDS patient in Johnson City died, the hospital took the equipment that had been used to treat him and buried it in a secret location um, so that it uh, wouldn't accidentally be used on anyone else. Um, and people who had AIDS um, were, at least early on, um, often discriminated against, even despised, in part, in large part, because in the U.S., AIDS first appeared primarily among homosexual men and drug users. So, while some people wanted the government to spend money to try to find a cure, um, others felt people with AIDS had it coming, and the government did not invest much in AIDS research at the time. Reagan also opposed unions, which he said made business and the government less efficient and more expensive. Um, in particular, when air traffic controllers went on strike in 1981, he declared that as public employees, they did not have the right to strike. Their work stoppage was creating a national emergency, and that allowed Reagan to use the Taft-Hartley Act from the Eisenhower administration to break the strike. He ordered 13,000 strikers back to work, um, but only 1,300 went. The, uh, Ninety percent remained on strike, so he fired them all and dissolved their union, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, or PATCO for short. 
And the Federal Aviation Administration had to train thousands of new air traffic controllers in a hurry, as the fired ones were not able to go back to work in their field um, for five years. Um, and many air traffic controllers felt it was a deep insult when the main airport in Washington, D.C. was named after Ronald Reagan. But while this was certainly dramatic action by Reagan, it was really just part of an ongoing trend of declining union power that can be traced back to the 1950s, a trend some people feel has badly hurt the working class of America. Others have said it makes companies more profitable, which benefits America's economy as a whole. And despite the deficit and some other problems, many Americans clearly did feel they were doing better. Um, by 1984, um, and, vote, and uh, voted for Reagan in large numbers when he ran against the Democratic candidate Walter Mondale. Um, Mondale's candidacy is probably most interesting, not for his own sake, but the sake of his vice president, Geraldine Ferraro, who in 1984 became the first woman to run as a vice presidential candidate for a major political party. Although she had not run successfully, in the election of 1984, Ronald Reagan won with the largest margin in the Electoral College in the nation's history. Um, 525 electoral votes to 13. Um, Mondale only carried the District of Columbia and barely carried his home state of Minnesota. Reagan reassured voters that it was morning in America. And many Americans admired Reagan's positive attitude, especially after the malaise of the 1970s. Even an assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan in 1981 simply led to greater popularity for the president. Um, as people sympathized with, uh, with the injured leader, um, but appreciate his sense of humor. He told his wife after being shot, sorry, honey, I forgot to duck. When he went into surgery, he told the doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. And the chief surgeon said, Mr. President, we're all Republicans today. Furthermore, women appreciated Reagan's nomination to the Supreme Court of Sandra Day O'Connor, who in 1981 became the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Reagan did restore Americans' confidence and pride in themselves and their country, in part through a new arms race with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, Reagan described as an evil empire, and said that a new arms race made the U.S. capable of defending ourselves and our allies. Furthermore, it forced the Soviet Union to spend money to keep up with American military spending, money the Soviets could not afford um, because of the expense of its war in Afghanistan. Um, you know, tremendously bloody, unpopular, and expensive war. And Reagan did not just build new bombers and missiles, but he promoted what he called the Strategic Defense Initiative, but it, or SDI for short, but better known as Star Wars. This was a plan for, for land-based and space-based lasers that could shoot down enemy missiles potentially making the United States and our allies safe from nuclear attack if we could shoot down ICBMs in space. He offered to share this technology with the Soviet Union as well, so they too would feel safe. Because if one country is safe from nuclear attack, that throws off the logic of mutual assured destruction. If we built the Star Wars program, we might in theory be able to launch a nuclear attack, knowing the Soviets could not truly retaliate. And Reagan funded anti-communist groups around the world. In Afghanistan, he supported the Mujahideen, um, guerrilla groups fighting against the Soviets. There were many Mujahideen groups, and we did not support them all, but did support a number of them. Um, he sent troops to invade the Caribbean island of Grenada when pro-communist forces overthrew its government and supposedly threatened Americans um, living and traveling in Grenada. In Nicaragua, um, a communist government known as the Sandinistas had seized power. And so Reagan sent um, money and weapons and advisors to help their opponents, known as the Contras, 
because they were contra or against the Sandinista government. However, um, following uh, America's involvement in Vietnam, which had begun with money and in weapons and in advisors, Congress didn't want this happening again and passed a series of laws in 1982, 1983, and 1984 known collectively as the Boland Amendment. The Boland Amendment was meant to prevent the United States from directly funding the Contras or allowing the CIA to support their activities. And the Contras were certainly controversial because they were accused of committing atrocities in their counter-revolution and in reality probably were at least as brutal as the Sandinistas, both of whom were murderous groups. Um, destroying the country each hoped to leave. But we, even though it was illegal to fund the Contras, we still really wanted to fund the Contras. And so we began to secretly sell weapons to Iran through secret Israeli agents. Um, and Iran may have hated the United States, but they needed our supplies because their military under the Shah had been built up by the United States. So at a time when the U.S. and Iran hated each other, we were secretly selling them weapons. And Iran was also um, using their influence on Lebanese terrorists known as Hezbollah to negotiate the release of American hostages there. Um, and in the money secretly obtained, these weapon sales was funneled to the Contras in violation of the Boland Amendment. This Iran-Contra affair was discovered in 1986 and became a scandal that embarrassed the Reagan administration, although the president always claimed he had not known about it, um, which suggested that he was either lying because he should have known, or if he really didn't know, then perhaps he was ignorant of what was going on in his own administration, suggesting to some that Reagan was not a competent leader of the nation. Although in 1987, Reagan did take responsibility for the whole affair, um, even the parts he was unaware of, um, or claimed to be unaware of, although he did later pardon um, many of the leading figures involved. In El Salvador, Reagan supported anti-communist forces, although just as in Nicaragua, they were at least as bad as the communists they opposed, but at least they weren't communists. During a civil war in Lebanon, Reagan sent in the Marines to try to stop the civil war, but ultimately pulled them out after a suicide bomber drove a truck loaded with explosives into the Marine barracks in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon. The U.S. was also having trouble with Libya under their dictator Muammar Gaddafi, um, who challenged American power in a couple of cases, um, including um, by supporting many terrorists, even having training camps for terrorists in the deserts of Libya. And some terrorists supported by Libya um, bombed a nightclub in Berlin, Germany in 1986, choosing that nightclub because it was popular with American soldiers stationed there, and two of those soldiers were killed in the blast. In response, Reagan sent bombers um, to attack Libya, um, the second time he had bombed Libya during his presidency, doing so much damage and nearly killing Gaddafi personally. Um, but after this, Libya backed away from their support for terrorism. All Gaddafi would remain in power um, for, uh, for many years to come, until finally overthrown by his people um, in 2011. And while the, well, another reason Iran needed American military equipment was because they were fighting a war with Iraq, um, in which the United States was also supporting Iraq um, in a border war um, that ended up killing about two million people, um, but seeing no land changed hands. Um, and we support Iran in this war because officially, or probably we support Iraq, because we hated Iran officially. In fact, we were arming both sides in this conflict uh, and built Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq's army, into the fifth largest in the world. Now, during Ronald Reagan's first term as president, the Soviet Union was led by Leonid Brezhnev, who'd been in power since 1964 until his death in 1982. He was replaced 
by Yuri Andropov, a former head of the KGB, a strong opponent of any reform or democratization ever since witnessing the Hungarian Revolution as a young man in 1956. But he's not a young man anymore, and he died in 1984, to be replaced by Konstantin Chernyenko, um, who would be in charge when the Soviet Union chose to boycott the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles in response to America's boycott of the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. Clearly, none of these leaders were willing to return to the detente of the 1970s. But Chernenko was not a young man either. In 1985, he died as well. And so in Reagan's second term, the Soviet Union would be led by a younger man um, who would feel both a personal desire and public pressure for reform. Mikhail Gorbachev had grown up on a collective farm. He had seen the hardships of the peasants, and even asked if Soviet farmers really had a life much different from that of the serfs under the czars. And so Gorbachev began policies known as perestroika, often translated as reform, probably better translated as restructuring, in trying to reform the Soviet government. Um, particularly trying to make local government a bit more responsive to the people. His policy of glossnost means openness and allowed some very limited freedom of, uh, of the press um, and indeed of the media in general, among other things, allowing a bit of access um, to television and movies um, from the United States and Western Europe. And Gorbachev did this in part because he truly believed the Soviet Union was not properly taking care of its people, especially its farmers, but also because he was kind of forced to make some change. The Soviet economy was falling apart due to the expense um, of a new arms race and its involvement in Afghanistan, and simply due to the fact that its state-run economy was failing. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, even the 50s, the Soviet government had been able to force modernization, but eventually Soviet control had led to stagnation um, as people became afraid to innovate or challenge the status quo. Um, and so during Reagan's second term, he would meet four different times with Mikhail Gorbachev, um, working out in some cases a reduction in tension. Um, although not exactly a new detente. One of their big accomplishments would be the ratification of, um, of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START, um, although it was not um, fully ratified until 1991, did not go into force until 1994, but this was a pledge eventually carried out to reduce the number of nuclear weapons each country owned. By 2001, the world's nuclear arsenals had been cut by about 80%. But fear not, we still have enough nukes to destroy all the Russians if we need to. In 1987, not long before their third meeting, Ronald Reagan visited Berlin, as Kennedy had done 25 years before, and he gave a speech in front of the Berlin Wall, and he praised Gorbachev's reforms, but he said they had not gone far enough and directly addressed the Soviet leader, saying that if he really meant the reforms he promised, that he should come to Berlin. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, come to Berlin. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And as the citizens of the Soviet Union began to experience some freedom um, through perestroika and glasnost, and began to have more exposure to the luxuries of the West, as access to Western radio and television also gave them access to Western advertisements, and wanted things that in the West were commonplace, but seemed luxurious in the Soviet Union, like popular brand names. Levi's jeans were popular in the United States and Western Europe, and the Soviets wanted Levi's too. Pepsi Cola was actually more popular than Coke in the 1980s because it was a strange time. And the Soviets wanted Pepsi. Um, you might even be able to buy it in a can, 
um, soda vending machines in the Soviet Union um, just had a spout. Um, you pushed the button and the soda came out into a cup provided for you. You drank your soda and put the cup back for the next person. In the Soviet Union, of course, you even shared your germs. Um, they wanted the convenience of McDonald's, um, which was serving billions of Big Macs by the 1980s. Um, and so as reform was coming, people began to want it to come even faster. And this is often when revolutions come, not when things are at their worst, but when things are beginning to get better and people want even more improvement more quickly than the government is prepared to let it come. Um, and pressure from the public led to Gorbachev pulling the Soviet military out of Afghanistan in 1989. And the Soviet Union satellites in Eastern Europe began to demand greater freedom too. Indeed, in 1989, Hungary elected a non-communist government and opened its border with Austria. And soon people from all over Eastern Europe were going to Hungary, and from Hungary to Austria, and from there to any place they liked. In particular, people were leaving East Germany indirectly for the West. And in East Germany, pressure for reform led to demands for free travel between East and West, particularly between East and West Berlin. In November of 1989, the East German government announced they would allow some travel between East and West Berlin, but they didn't specify how that travel would work. Upon hearing that travel would be permitted, though, crowds flooded to the wall, began to jam the checkpoints, as the border guards weren't sure exactly what to do. As the checkpoints became jammed, people began to approach the Berlin Wall and climb over it uh, on November 9, 1989. A couple days before, the guards would have shot them on the spot. Today, they didn't know what to do and stood back as people climbed over the wall, danced on top of the wall, and within a few days began tearing it down. With hammers and pickaxes and eventually construction equipment, they drove in to smash the Berlin Wall. And less than a year later, on October 3rd, 1990, Germany officially reunified under the West German government. And other communist countries in Eastern Europe began overthrowing their communist regime between 1989 and 1991. Czechoslovakia um, even split into two countries, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, in a peaceful revolution known as the Velvet Revolution. Velvet because it was soft and also because of the Czechoslovakian people's love um, for the band Velvet Underground. The communist country of Yugoslavia also began to break up, um, but much less peacefully. Um, in a series of civil wars known as the Yugoslav Wars, infamous for the ethnic cleansing that took place during them, um, as different ethnic groups within the former Yugoslavia hoped to make their own parts um, clean of other ethnicities. This was viewed as a more pleasant term than genocide. But demands for reform did not work everywhere. In communist China, um, there were massive demonstrations in Tiananmen Square in Beijing uh, in early 1989. Um, at first, the Chinese government wasn't quite sure what to do, and some of their leaders were open to the idea of reform. When the um, army was first sent in to stop the protests, a very famous image seen around the world was a a protester in a white shirt facing down the tanks, which stopped and backed off. But after thinking about this a few days, the Chinese government decided they could not allow this kind of reform. They sent the tanks back in, and this time they didn't stop. Um, and the demonstrations were crushed, uh, quite literally, by the Chinese government. And as communism fell, at least in most of Eastern Europe, um, in the Soviet Union, hard-line politicians and military officers, fearful of losing their power, attempted a coup, placing Gorbachev under house arrest and hoping to reverse his policies of 
perestroika, and glasnost. But most people in the Soviet Union, including many members of the government, uh, most notably perhaps the president of Russia, one of the 15 republics in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and former mayor of Moscow, Boris Yeltsin, led opposition to this coup, which quickly collapsed. Gorbachev was released from house arrest, was officially still leader of the country, but had lost his authority. And over the next couple months, August and September of 1991, all the republics in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics began to declare independence from the USSR. And on Christmas Day, 1991, Gorbachev resigned. December 26, um, the Soviet Union officially dissolved. And Boris Yeltsin would go on to serve as the president of Russia until 1999, during which time he oversaw democratization, economic liberalization, and friendship with Western Europe and the United States, but also a time of economic problems and growing corruption. And Ronald Reagan is generally given credit for the collapse of the Soviet Union his consistent support of anti-communist groups around the world, and his military spending were too much for the Soviet Union to keep up with. Although, this built, of course, on the work of many earlier presidents, and by the time the Soviet Union fell, Reagan had been out of office for over two years, being followed as president by his own vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, who was elected president in 1988, the first sitting vice president to be elected president since Martin Van Buren succeeded Andrew Jackson in 1836. 